From the keyboard to the boardroom, this is the business of esports. This is the Business of Esports podcast. I am Paul the Prophet Dawalibi. I'm joined today by my friend and co-host, the Honorable Judge Jimmy Barada. For those of you who are new here, welcome to the official podcast of esports. What we do is we cover the most pressing gaming and esports topics and news of the week, but we look at all of it through a business and C-suite lens. We dissect, we analyze the business implications of everything happening in this industry. For our regular listeners, thank you guys for all the love that you show the podcast. Thank you for all the five-star ratings and reviews. If you haven't yet, go leave a five-star rating on the podcast anywhere you listen to it or a comment maybe if you watch it on YouTube. Uh, Anything that uh, brings love and attention to the podcast, maybe sharing it with a colleague. We really, really appreciate it. That's how this podcast has continued to grow. Jimmy, how are you doing this week? Uh, Busy, busy this week, Paul, I think for both of us. And I'm excited to share with our audience, not gaming news or gaming related, but just so our regular listeners are aware. Not I'm yet. Not this. yet. What? I, 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 just, I slipped. It just slipped. Okay. okay. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm getting married this weekend. I guess Paul wanted to make it a bigger thing. I'm just happy and excited to share it with the world. Uh, but I think there's even bigger news or equally big news. I no, no, say, no. We, I'm not going to. We're not going to. Uh, well, that's all the news they're getting this week. That's it. That's it. That's all they're getting this week. Let's just start over. (laughs) But this is the kind of guy that Jimmy is, you know, getting married literally in a few days because we tape this for those who don't know behind the scenes, even though you probably listened to it on the weekend. uh, We tape this on on Wednesdays. And so Jimmy is literally days away from getting married and still doing uh, the podcast and going to do the weekly news show, which, by the way, you should check it out uh, every Wednesday evening, 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. So are you are you all set, Jimmy? Are you like good to go? Well, that's why I got it's an esport policy. themed wedding, right? You it's know, a gaming gonna have, themed wedding. We're going to have some PCs, you know, with sponsored in the corner. <laughs> and my, my tux has LED lights down the lapels on the front. <laughs> got to have the RGB lighting. Yeah. <laughs> That's uh, and also that's why I got to apologize to our regular listeners for our guests that listened last week for the live show. You know, I actually had to miss that. I had a dance lesson and then in a tasting as well. So I'm uh, sorry to have missed that. And if you don't listen every Wednesday night, uh, 8 30 PM Eastern, we do a live show with the news and I'm usually there, but, but had to miss cause I got two left feet and <laughs> had to take some dance lessons. <laughs> I like how the one dance lesson you think is going to fix this. I mean, the, is the, is the, oh, oh, there have been months of dance lessons. Oh, okay. This, this is just the last one. Okay. I wasn't sure if it was like the, the, there was this feeling that one dance lesson was going to solve all the problems. Here. Yeah. Right. Got it. Mastered. On to the next one. Yeah. It's weird because I was going to ask you if you had had a chance. I know you're a bit of a mobile gamer. I know, you know, you have your Razer Kishi and, you know, you, you play some mobile games. Have you tried Diablo Immortal yet? You know, if it wasn't for the other exciting news, I probably would have started <laughs> with that. I am level 18 or 19. I am using the Razer Kishi that you kindly got for me. A uh, shout out to our friends uh, over at the Las Vegas uh, Razer store. And um, it's uh, you know, I was never a huge Diablo head. I have some friends that are obsessed with Diablo. Couldn't wait for the next, you know, next release and, and just love the title. And I was always underwhelmed by it. And I'm sorry if that's offensive. It's just I play a lot of RPGs. I play a lot of games. I thought it was more of just one dungeon after the other with not a lot of substance to it. And then I realized, well, that's because it's, it's it was a mobile game that was on PC. So now it's where it belongs on mobile. And I'm <laughs> loving it. <laughs> Have you have you spent any money? That's the question I have. I have I you know I read the articles about what it takes to to be what is it a hundred k to to fully level everything for a end game. I think I, to do it like rapidly, right? Like to accelerate yeah. everything. Right. I have not spent a dollar. I'm going to hold out as long as I can. If they do a Balenciaga collab, we 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 know I'm suspect <laughs> like Fortnite. But other than that, I think I'll be safe. 
you know who I absolutely want to get their opinion on this. And this is, it's going to be one of those episodes where we, I'm sure we're going to go down a rabbit hole here, but we have an amazing, amazing guest as always on this podcast, on today's podcast, we have none other than Andy Ockletree, who is the VP of gaming at Subnation. Andy, welcome to the business of esports podcast. Man, that was a good start. I muted my <laughs> mic. Oh, I'm so sorry. Do we have to do that over? No, not at all. Not. Andy. Okay, great, great. I, I, oh, Andy. I, hey. So, um, before we jump into you and Subnation, I just, this is one of those where, you know, you're, I, I know you're going to talk about your background, but I'm going to give the little bit of the sneak peek for our listeners that you spent time at, um, at Activision Blizzard and, and you spent time at Mattel and Hasbro, like you have a, an incredible pedigree and gaming background. So as a guy who spent time at Activision Blizzard, have you played Diablo Immortal? And what do you think of it if you have? I, I have not. As a guy who okay. played Diablo 1, 2, and 3, I don't know if I can play Diablo Immortal. I will. <laughs> I will eventually. Um, but, okay. you, you know, I think it's pretty damning that, uh, that it, really, it really does seem that it was always destined to be a mobile game. And uh, I, I just wonder, A, what this means for the other franchises, right, in Blizzard's and Activision's Activision is, is fine diving into their library, but Blizzard has been very reticent uh, to do anything yeah. that, that damages the holy integrity of Blizzard's IP. And, and it really makes me wonder what else is next um, in, in terms of, you know, because that's they, they could turn on they could turn on cash flow pretty easily as, as, yeah. as much as Diablo is getting roasted. I mean, Jimmy, you're playing it. I will play it eventually. I know Chris Mann, our COO at Subnation, is playing it. Like, uh, it's going to make a ton of money. No doubt. No, no, no question. And, and Andy, you mentioned Subnation. So sorry for the, the detour here, but would love for our listeners that maybe don't know about you or haven't heard of Subnation, would love a little bit of your background, how you got into gaming, why you did, and, and what you're up to at Subnation and what Subnation is all about. Yeah, sure. So my background uh, actually started in film. Uh, I went to a school called Emerson College, uh, just an hour north of me in Boston. I'm in Rhode Island right now uh, and was able to get a spot at Marvel Studios. I worked for Kevin Feige out there um, first as an intern and then as his assistant. Um, and soon after that, got into digital media. Um, but Marvel is always going to be close to my heart. Um, that said, I was always wondering when the path would take me to games. I've always been a huge gamer. Um, I still am, but uh, you know, yeah, so much, so much so that I think if you were to look, if I unblurred this, you'd see a bunch of like gaming bric-a-brac back here. I've got a fallout helmet. I've got a mega man. Uh, I've got my, my orc, uh, statue, my horde statue. Oh, back here. <laughs> yep. Yep. Paul's not um, happy about that one, Andy. <laughs> I actually, well, I actually did want an alliance statue, and they were just giving them out, and they only had they only had orc statues left. So <laughs> that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. The alliance one was much cooler. Um, you know, so it's it's always been I've always dabbled in the intersection of I would say pop culture, geek culture, um, and mainstream culture. Marvel was the first. Uh, after that, I joined a place called Jib Jab. Uh, which Jib Jab, if you're you know not familiar, was uh, back in the day uh, a viral video studio that then changed their business model uh, to become kind of a customized content studio. Uh, they did some e-card stuff, and I grew with them uh, on that journey for about six years. Uh, I started; I was the first guy there. Uh, me and the two co-founders at a small studio in Santa Monica packing boxes full of merchandise, doing whatever we could uh, until uh, about 2010 when I decided there's more that I want to do out there and uh, there's businesses and, and brands I want to try to build on a bigger scale. Um, so uh, I got my MBA at UCLA Anderson, uh, met a lot of great people, and that's how I got synced up with Mattel. Uh, and joined Mattel uh, as an internship where I got to work on Masters of the Universe. So I'm an 80s kid. Uh, I grew up on Masters for sure. Uh, I still have actually 
in a bag in my basement, I have about two dozen Masters of the Universe figures uh, that I have yet to set up here. So, so, so finding a way to tap into my passions and being lucky enough to do that has always been a part of my career. And, you know, looking back, I, I feel humbled and so um, lucky to have, have worked with all these franchises. Um, started in brand management and marketing at Mattel, uh, worked on franchises like Toy Story, uh, again, Masters of the Universe, again, a different line, uh, and also Halo. So that was the first time I got to brush the world of video games, just touch it on the consumer product side. And I got to go to 343 Studios, and it was like going to Mecca. Um, I got to like officially go to E3, you know, as an industry guy. So that was, that was when I got my first taste. And from then, I was like, how am I going to get there? You know, I've been, I've been skirting around this my whole life. Um, soon enough, I got an opportunity at Hasbro. That's what brought me to Rhode Island to work on Star Wars uh, as their, their lead in, in consumer marketing. And again, another passion project, and actually one that I didn't realize at the time, really set me up for um, understanding, I think, in, in talking with and, and engaging with esports communities. There is, when you look at the, the fan community for Star Wars, um, I would say in terms of how vocal they are, in terms of how passionate they are, the ownership they feel for the thing they love, um, and, and when you get them together, the energy you feel, uh, a lot of that, I think, is shared by the esports community, which I, I also love and love getting to be yeah. part. Um, so, so I did that for a little bit at Hasbro. Also worked on Nerf, where I got to work on some stuff in video games as well. We worked on some blasters that were uh, Overwatch related, that were uh, Fortnite, uh, and then joined Activision Blizzard in 2019 after doing some consulting uh, in 2018. And uh, that was on the Overwatch League. And that, that is, that was, I was on cloud nine. I couldn't believe that I was at the hallowed gates in Irvine. You've seen them. The magical, like Willy Wonka-esque lizard gate, um, which, which we've all seen because like, how many pictures have we seen of people protesting in front of those gates <laughs> in the last two years? Um, but at that point, I was like, wow, you know, this is, this is magic. I get to be on this campus. I get to... Uh, work with with so many people who get to build games um and that was an amazing experience so on that i was in charge of uh, integrated and owned and operated marketing uh so i was over that i was kind of the guy at the middle in between the game team overwatch league social content uh and then kind of the lead for partnerships there and a lot to dive into there i'm sure we'll talk about uh i also got a chance to uh and this isn't really something that's i think might not even be in my profile. Uh, I also got a chance to lead marketing for World of Warcraft esports and Hearthstone esports after a few months there. I led a team over there as well, which is a totally different experience. And, and I have to say, really speaks to the difference between how Blizzard wanted to handle esports and how Activision wanted to handle it and their vision for it. And, and I think, you know, uh, Blizzard sees it as a, and, and, who knows now, but I think at the time, Blizzard really saw it as truly a community tool, a tool for engagement. They really wanted to, Mike Morheim and Amy, Amy Morheim, who, who started uh, Blizzard Esports, really seemed to infuse it with a ton of passion. And it's legit. Blizzard is legit. Oh, I'm sorry, Jimmy, am I not supposed to say that stuff? You're okay. <laughs> it's an adult okay. show. It'll, I'm sorry, it's Paul. It's legit, but it's, it's but, you know. <laughs> I I just uh at the time I, I walked in saying like feeling like this is this is like the real stuff. Um Activision of course has uh goals to make esports the next major sport, or at least did at the time. So um it was interesting seeing both of those sides. And then um in 2021 I, I joined uh Subnation. First on contract, helping them build a bespoke esports league, which we're still building in the background while we do some other stuff. Uh, and then joined as their VP of gaming in November of last year and took on a number of other things, including uh, PUBG Esports Americas, which I pitched for and we, we ended up winning the agency of record. So Subnation is the agency of record for PUBG Esports Americas, uh, North America, Central America, South America. 
um, and uh, leading that team and working on a number of other projects in the gaming space for them. Man, Andy, I, uh, like I said, such an illustrious background. I probably I could pro I have a thousand questions I want to ask you. Let me start with Do PUBG because I think that's interesting, yeah. right? Because you guys are working on PUBG right now with Subnation. Um, what are some of the big differences you've seen or or you've noticed between how PUBG markets itself as a league versus, for example, how Overwatch League marketed itself? Like, are there cultural differences? Are there, are there creative differences? Are there strategic differences? I'm curious to tease those out. Yeah, so, I mean, you and Jimmy know, you know, better than most, right, about esports and, and esports orgs and the push to make these not just competitive orgs, but cultural orgs as well. Right, and the push to incorporate more and more cultural elements that are outside of hardcore competition and move it away from the core. And that was actually a goal of us at Overwatch League. It was like, we're here. How do we expand to here? I would say PUBG, they love the core. They want to engage the core. We said, hey, we want to grow, help you grow the core. And I think that's a goal, but, but they, from their approach to uh, how they market, uh, the team that I work with there at Crafton, uh, they're in Santa Monica, so Crafton, uh, North America, I believe. Um, they are, they're hardcore. They're hardcore esports. Um, and that was really refreshing, actually. It felt like, you know, here's some people that I could sit down and have a number of beers with um, and, and, shoot, and shoot the stuff with them. Um, I think the difference with them is, yeah, whereas... Overwatch has these aspirations, again, Overwatch League and Call of Duty League, has aspirations to achieve the cultural status of something like the NFL. Maybe not the, the same level, right, or, or um, size, but the, that same type of status, uh, PUBG, at least at the moment, you know, is, is uh, very comfortable to be uh, a, a great esports brand. And it really is. I, I actually enjoy watching PUBG more than I enjoy watching Overwatch. And I think there's a lot of things with PUBG that lend itself to a better viewing experience. I think that's part of their strength. And I think that's part of why they have the audience they have and why they have the focus they have is because uh, that product just really speaks to people who know and understand strategy, people who know and understand uh, what it takes to, you know, successfully crack. Um, crack a, a kind of large scale meta. Not saying that Overwatch doesn't, there's plenty of meta there. Um, but I really think PUBG's razor focused on that audience. I mean, Andy, do you feel like that's the winning strategy in general with esports? Like trying to be more than just an esport, trying to be some kind of cultural phenomenon. Do you feel now with everything you've seen and all the all the you know organizations you've worked with that maybe that's a mistake? that it's sort of a fool's errand to pursue that. And, and the focus should be more on, like, I think you spoke fondly of like community at Blizzard around esports mm -hmm. early on. You know, I'm, I'm curious if how you feel about that. Well, I mean, I, I tend to really identify with the core um, as I'm a member. Like I play PUBG myself with my friends. You know, I've spent uh, hundreds of hours playing PUBG. Um, I, I do think that you have to know who you are, what your brand is and what you are. And yes, I think that for call of duty expanding beyond, right. They've got, they, they already, they're a household name. They've already got the kind of brand equity that could allow them to take what is a sub brand of their franchise, right. Esports or a sub, a sliver, um, and expand into the mainstream. I think it's big enough where they can, I think. You know, if you compare it to traditional sports, um, you look at something like PUBG, uh, can compare it to something like tennis or, or you know, um, compare it to something like even golf to a certain degree. Um, there is, there is, you're not going to see, you're not going to see like a tennis star star in their own space jam, I guess is what I'm saying. And that's yeah. okay. Right. Because yeah. because they, they are speaking to an audience that's underserved one uh, and wants to devour tennis content. I have some friends who are, who are really big tennis fans um, and 
and people who are, who are perfectly happy to do that. And, the, and, and as a sport, it's at the point where it's not, it doesn't have the audience that it can expand to that next level. So I think to your question, I, I think for most esports uh, franchises, I think it is about really understanding, you know, who you're serving, um, not necessarily trying to stretch too much outside, but trying to think insularly, you know, from an insular perspective, looking inside, how do we serve these fans more? How do we bring more people in that might want to experience this? Um, and, and yeah, is the pot, is the, is the size of the prize on paper going to be as large? No, obviously not. But I mean, it's all about your ability to pull in that larger audience. And, and I think the smart money is, is behind people who know what they offer and, and the audience they're speaking to. Uh, you, you know, sorry, go ahead, Jimmy. I was just curious the mechanisms used to attract those audiences, perhaps the red tape or the restrictions that one might encounter with an Activision Blizzard type of client or project versus other. And and if we can just get a little bit, unpack that a little bit further, Andy, because I, I think that's really insightful as a, as a approach to attracting audiences and then engaging with them at a higher level fundamentally as a topic would love to just learn a little bit more about what you found to be successful in that regard. Yeah, sure. So, you know, I think obviously um, when you're talking to any community, especially an esports audience, um, your ability to think authentically or to speak authentically uh, really is within the bounds of corporate, uh, corporate guidelines, red tape, as you say, guardrails. Um, and I think to incentivize people to make them feel the community, to make them feel that the brand, uh, you know, understands and is offering something that, uh, that's in sync with what they want. I think you need to speak on their level. I think that's hard to do at a place like Activision Blizzard. Um, I think it's easier at craft on, but I think, uh, you know, they're, they're a big company as well. Um, I think they do a better job of speaking authentically and directly to their people. Um, Activision Blizzard, it's tough. I mean, it's, you know, it is a, it is a, what, Fortune 100 company at this point, 500 at least. Um, and there are a lot of people, you know, who are, I think, protecting the company from a lot of things. So, um, I, I think, I think there's something there in terms of other things that incentivize people to watch, you know, uh, esports, they love their drops. They love their incentives. Uh, that that's something that I think that everybody can get behind. Um, there there were some issues, obviously, doing that at Activision Blizzard and Craft On. Technically, like you've got to you've got to have like either the technical you, you've got to be technically set up for that. And we actually had an issue with that at Activision Blizzard in two thousand uh, two thousand twenty when we launched season three. Uh, we lost like six months of incentives. No, like, actually, let me back that up. Like three to four months of incentives drops. Um, and it was a big deal. But I do think that that's something in terms of you ask about incentivizing people and driving people to watch. I, I think that is something that everybody can get behind. Everybody loves free stuff. I'm sure Paul wants to get into the Overwatch stuff. I just have one more before I forget because you had mentioned uh, the prize pool, right? And what incentivizes yeah. kids from that regard. Um, have you noticed a bit, I mean, also, you know, and, and worth mentioning that there are certain restrictions on what that price pool can be given what the, the developer publisher mandates, right? And their guidelines, have you noticed different, um, turnout or, I, I mean, does the money always directly relate to a higher engagement, higher interest, higher publicity and, and just hype, or is there kind of a cutoff where there's a period of diminishing return and there's a certain sweet spot that, you know, it's above its weight, so to speak. Yeah, I, I think that I think it's important to signal, you know, that an event is is large with a prize pool of a certain a certain amount. Let's call it six figures, right? I think that when you get down to the actual like like you know the actual ranking of that, if somebody's offering, so I think when I was when I was at Overwatch, um, the prize pool. I think for Overwatch that year was like 1.2 million total. Um, and I think the prize pool for CDL was something like 1.4. Uh, 
I, when you get to those levels, I don't think it makes sense. Where it really gets bonkers is when people offer, like, you know, Fortnite and uh, CS, I think it was CSGO, uh, we're offering just unprecedented prize pools. I think we're at the point where that's what, that's when you create a historic can't miss moment when the prize pool is so large that it's unprecedented, that there's so much at stake and on the line, right? And, and the drama is, is, as high as that prize pool, I think that we're getting to a point where that's not enough. Um, I think we're to a point where if you were to tell me that, you know, Fortnite is hosting a tournament and had a $5 million prize pool, that's not going to do anything to, I, I'm not into Fortnite. That's not really going to do anything for me at this point, because we've been going on uh, a number of years now with elevated uh, elevated prize pools and elevated competitions in that way. Um, I, I think where it gets actually more interesting is less the prize pool and more who's competing for the prize pool. I think uh, you know. I, I think there is a there's a push and pull uh, and a tension between competitive right. And we saw this at Overwatch League for sure. Uh, competitive, not integrity, but um, I would say competitive concerns and optimization and those who had audience uh, and could actually bring in views and have personalities people wanted to follow. I, I thought we were oftentimes putting the attention on the wrong things like prize pool uh, and not concentrating enough on the personalities that A, we were trying to build or B, were already out there and we could go up. It feels anecdotally, anecdotally, at least to me, like there's no difference these days between a million dollar price pool or a three million dollar price pool. Right. Like the, yeah. there's sort of this point where it's big enough that it gets a lot of attention and a lot of eyeballs. And there's probably a, a huge number that gets more attention. Right. Like call it twenty five million plus where now now it's a major event that mainstream media covers even yes but everything sort of in between that one and 25 sort of doesn't really matter right if it's one or it's four or it's six um it doesn't seem to have a huge effect on the audience Andy, i'm curious uh you you hinted at this idea that subnation is doing a, a league of its own mm -hmm. um I'd love, I don't know how much you can talk about it or say about it, but I'd love a little bit of insight there in terms of what are you guys sort of bring to the table that you think is unique or that, you know, learnings you've taken from your time, for example, at Overwatch League, either things you're doing or not doing as a consequence. Sure. So to tease a little bit about what we're building, um, it's something really, so I mentioned, you know, um, kind of that, that focus on personality, that focus on individual players. Uh, versus uh, focus on the competitive whole, uh, we're building something around pro athletes uh, as as a gaming, as a an esports and a gaming platform and league. Um, there's a lot of athletes out there who want to get into esports, want to get into competitive gaming, have tried, but have found it incredibly difficult. Um, it's not just like a guy like Ocho Cinco, right? To use to use that, or even Juju. Uh, Schuster Smith, Smith Schuster, Schuster Smith, I always mess that up, um, can just flip on Twitch, a, a Twitch account, and, and that, you know, everybody from their IG is going to migrate over. Um, they're finding it difficult. And I think what we're seeing as the opportunity is to create a container, to create a platform for them in which we are giving them a kind of a turnkey solution, right, at the very basis level but be also providing uh, a place where audience is starting to aggregate and already is. So while their whole audience isn't coming there, there are plenty of people who are already into it, are into this intersection of professional um, sports and, and esports, if you will, um, and receptive to what they're offering to bring it to the table. Um, yeah, what else, what else can I, yeah, go ahead. No, I'm curious because how in your own models, in your own sort of internal discussions, how much of a traditional athlete's fan base do you think will come over to whatever they're doing on the esports side? Like, is it 80 percent? Is it 50 percent or is it 5 percent? Like, just I'm curious. And I don't know if you have yeah. that data, Andy, but 
sort of roughly or anecdotally at least? I, I don't have specific data, but I can tell you that, yes, I believe it's closer to, I wouldn't say 5%, you know, I'm an optimist, but it's, I don't think it's in the 80% range. I don't even think it's in the 50% range. Uh, I think it is closer to call it between 10 and 20%. Uh, I think that's a safe assumption. Um, Interesting. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's, I mean, there's a few reasons for that, though. You know, um, not really audience or gaming related. If you look at like a social account, for instance, like think about the amount of users there that are junk users, first of all, and, and are not following yeah. you what, into any endeavor. Um, but then in addition to that, uh, yeah, the sliver of people that are following you and a fan of you and also a big fan of esports and video games is a smaller subset naturally. Um, and, and I think that the, the last part of that is the challenge in getting somebody to migrate over. Um, no matter who you are, uh, you know, even if Tom Brady were to, were to turn on uh, an esports org tomorrow, um, it'd be a big deal. I'm sure they'd get a lot of people, but like, there's so much noise out there and so much happening. Yeah. Um, you, you really, you have one shot and uh, if, if you miss it, uh, it can be really hard to, to, uh, to make a big deal and get people over there. I think it's, I, I think migration is a challenge you know, to other platforms. And what is, what is the, the pitch to the athletes? Like what, what are the, what are they buying into? Is it the idea that this is going to expand their fan base? Is it the idea that uh, it's just something cool for them to do in the off season? Like what, what is the pitch to the, to the athletes themselves? Yeah, so I think athletes uh, think about gaming in a few different ways, and, and that tailors, you know, the pitch, obviously. So in, in one way, to your point, yeah, sometimes it is something just that they like to do, that they think it's cool. They're competitors, right? These are guys that are used to performing at a high level, so they're doing it. They say, if I'm doing this, you know, I, I might as well stream it. I want to make it worth it. I want to do it at a certain level. So I think there's guys who just love the, the game and, and want to do it like that. Um, there's also a number of guys that see this, and this is, I think this is really savvy, uh, see gaming as one of those ways in which they can diversify their brand and give themselves something that uh, not only offers other engagement and commercialization opportunities around their personal brand separate from their team, but also sets them up post-competition. Um, yeah. for when they're not competitors anymore, right? They get injured or they just retire um, or they, they kind of fade out of the competitive spotlight. Uh, they're setting themselves up for the future. Uh, and I think that's really smart. Jimmy, I don't know if you had anything else on this. I, I wanted to switch gears uh, to the different. I, I feel like we could have a whole episode just on this esports element, honestly, because we didn't really even scratch the WoW and Hearthstone uh, you know, that you had mentioned. Well, Andy. I'm going to come back to that, actually. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I wanted to, I Let's just want to hit on yeah. The, yeah. The, the Marvel, Hasbro, Mattel. Like, wh I think what's so cool about some of those experiences is it all revolves around interesting IP, right? Whether it was Marvel or Star Wars or, you know, whatever the, like, Nerf, like, big IP brands, Halo, things that you worked on in a context that wasn't actually gaming, Right. And one of the recurring themes on this podcast has been this idea of taking IP and turning it into video games. And we've seen some fail and some succeed. And having seen sort of all sides of the equation here, right? The, the, the people creating the IP, the gaming companies, the toy companies licensing the IP. Like, how do you, where do you stand on this idea of sort of does great IP automatically mean you can make a great game how much does it factor in um and and you know it, is the gaming world sleeping on ip that you know that maybe they shouldn't be at i just love a little bit of your your general view on this intersection of interesting ip and gaming yeah i i think star wars has shown that no, great ip doesn't always <laughs> mean great games i love star wars there's a <laughs> great Right, it's Jimmy. Would you agree with me there? Unfortunately, yeah, not not all right. of them have been great. There are some good ones, though. There are there are some good ones. Exactly. Well, exactly. A little bit sad that like some of the best though are Lego Star Wars. 
I mean, that to me, yeah. I don't know. That's subjective, I think. If, if you love Legos, <laughs> then it's a little awesome. I don't know. <laughs> but I think I think it's a great right. it's a great example because what Lego Star Wars does really well is recognizing how to gamify and how to deliver on some of the elements that make Star Wars so great. Like they usually feature pretty vast. Uh, they usually feature like pretty vast um, environments, the universe. They pull in a lot of elements from the universe. You look at the Skywalker saga, they give you a sense of, they, they definitely deliver, I think, on the epic scale of Star Wars um, in terms of characters, in terms of locations, in terms of vehicles, uh, which is something that Lego is already great at through their line. So, so I think that really makes sense. Um, you know, I also think that they offer a take on Star Wars uh, and, you know, a, an experience uh, with the IP um, that Star Wars fans were already craving. Star Wars fans love to have fun with the IP. They don't, some of them take it incredibly seriously, as we've seen, and that's very unfortunate when you see the, the negative results of, the, of that. But a lot, a lot more Star Wars fans, in my mind, um, you know, revel in uh, the the cheesiness of Star Wars sometimes, the ridiculousness, right, of the of the plots. Um, General Grievous's voice comes to mind. Uh, there's just many things to celebrate and enjoy in Star Wars, uh, and I think that I think that Lego does a great job of that. Um, you know, Andy, can I ask a specific question? Because yeah. we talked about this on last week's weekly news show, which was marvel the marvel mmo and mm -hmm. and the news story that we covered last week was it, this game got killed so yeah. I, i'm trying to remember now the studio that was producing it but it was marvel ip it was going to be an mmo and and at face value you look at that and you go this should be a, a runaway smash hit right like world of warcraft's 15 16 years old now 17 years old almost um Long in the tooth, the MMO space is ripe for the ripe for disruption. Marvel is as good an IP as you can get, really, these days. Why would they? Why? And we we had theories on that on that episode, but I'm curious, like, why cancel a game like that? And and assuming you think they cancel it because they didn't think they could make it work, why do you think that can't? Why did they think that can't work? Uh, I, I mean, you know, I think one of the big strengths of, of Marvel um, and, you know, I would say most comic book properties is uh, the power fantasy. And a lot of that is tied to particular characters. Um, obviously, the strength is in the characters themselves. And I think when you when you think about an, uh, an MMO uh, in player agency, player agency is number one, exploration, right? Um, you determine how you explore the world. I think. Star Wars lends itself more to that because it provides all these environments and an entire galaxy that we're interested in. I, I, for example, I have a number of Star Wars books, many of them sitting behind me, art books, uh, The Guide to Vehicles and Vessels. Thank you very much. Uh, it's one of my proudest uh, things that, that, you, that you can dissect and dive deeper into. And that's not to say that people aren't very interested in multi, you know, in understanding the many arcs of Doctor Strange. Um, but I think that's a very different proposition. And I think when you look at an MMO, again, in which the player defines the journey, um, it loses something when uh, you when you create a, a avatar template um, versus, you know, a kind of getting to go on a distinct journey and story uh, with these characters you love. The, the interplay of characters is also really important. How many times are you going to have, um, you know, all the great characters, uh, Captain Captain America, Iron Man, Stephen Strange, and, and Tony Stark going back and forth? How many opportunities do you really have to do that in something that's not narratively more on rails, like uh, Squeenix's yeah. Marvel game, right? And I, I think that's one of the ways in, in which it succeeds. It's obviously a touch-and-go kind of experience, but the banter between the characters. I played the demo and, and got to experience some of that. I think they nailed that. Uh, and yeah. It's really interesting, uh, Andy, you know, uh, about a month or two ago, well, probably more now time is 
something else. But, you know, we had Bruce Steen on the show, one of your former bosses over at Mattel, I'm sure. I think you guys might have been there around the same time. We had a similar concept or or similar discussion, rather, except this time it was picking apart different superheroes from one another and why certain ones sold, you know, like Batman that had all the gadgets was able to sell and that he was relatable because he was a human versus Superman who he was just all in one ready to go. And, And I love taking that, but then throwing these characters as if they were in an RPG and why that's less compelling, you know, to create a story around. So I think you hit it on the head there when you take Marvel and then you compare it to Star Wars. Uh, I'm curious out of all the IPs that you've worked on, and I know we, we spent a good a deal here talking about Star Wars, so I, I wouldn't be surprised if that was the one, you know, can you either share your favorite two or three or rather the companies that you worked with or the IPs that you worked on that really just approached it the right way? Because it's, it's just this crazy thing where you think of Marvel having this awesome vehicle pumping out superhero movies and TV shows and killing it, but really not getting it from a gaming perspective. And I think your insight is spot on there. Curious how you view some of the other IP that you've worked on. If, if you can share maybe the two or three best the ones that are doing it best that you say, keep an eye on these guys. They're going to come out with a fire game in the next two years or, or, you know, they should be. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah. So to your point, you know, I, I think um, Marvel and Star Wars to varying degrees have figured it out. Um, pardon the barking if you heard that. Um, the I think you know one of the most interesting ones to me is when you look at the assembly of characters as Masters of the Universe. I mean, you, you look at it is a rich, rich tapestry with all those characters, even with some of the settings, um, everything to create uh, different kinds of experiences. You mentioned a fighter. I think a fighter would be perfect for something like that. I don't think we're going to see one, but actually. Now that I say, actually, I'm going to back up on that because they, they have started to produce more Masters of the Universe content. They've started to produce more Masters of the Universe games. Um, actually, um, somebody I respect and got to work with a lot, Joe Ferenz from uh, GameFam. He's the C- CEO over there. They do a ton of stuff in Roblox. Just built a custom experience for Masters in Roblox. Um, so I, I'm going to be very interested to see what they, they do there. Um, Hot Wheels has proven that they can, uh, I got to work on that a little bit, they've proven that they can actually uh, distill what is so great about the play uh, in Hot Wheels, uh, which is the stunting, the -the over-the-top action, right? Um, And I think they can, you know, definitely, I think they have have proven they they know what it takes. You know, I, I do really respect those IPs, and I think they could. I think they there's more that they could do. Um, I still have to play the Hot Wheels game. I heard it's amazing, actually. Um, lastly, you know, I, I would actually say I feel for Halo. I, I worked on Halo. I have an affinity for Halo, and I I actually think that they need to reset in some way. I don't know. Not maybe not totally reset. I yeah. feel like 343 has lost their mojo a little bit, right? Like Halo BR was, I think, so obvious. And the fact that they never wanted to go there seemed weird to me. Yeah. Um, like a lot of questionable choices there where, you know, the IP, uh, Andy, I think that's such a great point. The IP is so strong there, right? And and it it's like gaming native, right? It's not like we're taking IP from another medium. Um, and so yeah, I think that's an insightful one. Let, let me just... Ask, uh, you know, we're, we're running low on time here. I want to I want to make sure we talk a little bit about this. And that is the future for Blizzard in your mind, Andy, from a, an esports league perspective. Do you think Microsoft changes the equation for this at all? Do you think, uh, you know, we start to see way more investment in things like World of Warcraft esports or Hearthstone esports that have been somewhat forgotten children up until now? Um, like, wh- how do you see this evolving with the new owner? You know, it's a great question. I want to just, Jimmy, I want to add one more, though, to my answer, and that is uh, Nerf. I think Nerf, oh, Nerf nice. has done a game. It kind, of, it, kind of, it, kind of, it kind of sucks. It's not a great game. But I think they have the opportunity to do a lot there. The collab yeah. with Fortnite, I think you said you worked on, too, and I saw those in store. Those were awesome. I thought that was brilliant, too, because what kid that's playing Fortnite doesn't want that toy gun in their in their you know closet to go bust out and shoot out their you know their sibling yeah they just need to be better about going the other way 
Um, I think they're doing a great job of going digital to physical, mm. taking game franchises gotcha, gotcha. and going to physical. I think they need That's to take their own brand. And and yeah. So anyway, so uh, sorry, Activision Blizzard, Microsoft. You know, I wonder if I think they're going to take a hard look at how much they're spending on Overwatch League and Call of Duty League. Microsoft, I mean, to be fair, is flush with cash. They seem to be okay spending on things. So that gives me hope. That gives me hope that they're going to say, listen, esports for us supports the franchise, and it's a five to 10 year proposition. It's not a one to two year proposition, and that's the way we're going to look at it. We're building audience, you know, we're building for the future of, of our franchise. Um, but there's another part of me that looks at, um, you know, what they're doing now in terms of Game Pass, uh, in which uh, the, and, and this is influenced kind of by my own feelings about esports and what it's going to take, I think, to take, take it to the next level. But with Game Pass, in which, um, you know, the, the sum and, and having a number of franchises on offer is really the, is really the appeal. I wonder if, you know, having a number of esports under one banner is something that they're looking into as a as a broadcast product as an event product um now that they've got these i think and you look at and you look at what unfortunately has happened with overwatch league um in terms of overall viewership uh, and even call of duty hasn't call of duty league hasn't gotten to the uh, i can i can tell you for sure that it hasn't gotten to the levels they wanted for it in terms of viewership i, I wonder I wonder if somebody takes a look and says, okay, you know, as leagues themselves, these are hard things to prop up because they are so dependent on singular franchises. Um, I think Call of Duty is not as much of a uh, liability for that. Overwatch certainly is. I don't know if you saw Overwatch or played Overwatch 1.2 that was just released. I'm sorry, yeah. Overwatch 2. My bad. Yeah. Little slip there understandable yeah. you mean the overwatch reskin yeah and that's that's trouble yeah. right that's trouble for the league and i think the league is doing a great job by the way keeping it fresh and keeping people entertained but but that's that's dangerous that's dangerous for the league and and they are totally tied to the success of the franchise um you know i think there's got to be a way to create some kind of league in which you're protecting yourself from that by bringing in a variety of games. Now, what I'm suggesting is tantamount to saying, what about a sports league where sometimes you play football, but guess what? Next week you play basketball. And then, you know, it's, it's not an easy proposition, but luckily gaming and the tools on offer for esports and, and the audiences, I think could give us that, that ability to do something like that. And that really excites it's me. It's a good point. And we don't need to be like traditional sports. We don't need to be. We can choose yep. to be, but we don't need to be. Um, one last very quick question before I throw it over to everyone's favorite new segment. Um, what what games have you picked for the Subnation League, or do you not know yet? You know, honestly, we, we don't know for sure yet, but we have been targeting the usual suspects and having some conversations. You know, that includes Call, Call of Duty will be one. Uh, and, and that's, we've been more, we've done a couple events with Call of Duty so far with uh, something called Trench Made Gaming, whose uh, founder, Marquez Valdez Scantling, is uh, an NFL player. He was on the Green Bay Packers, and I think he's on the Chiefs now. He just, yeah, he's on the Chiefs next season. Um, so that, uh, definitely looking at a wide array, though. Uh, like, I want, I, yes, Call of Duty is great, and, and the audience is is strong there, but in order to truly like the athletes we're bringing in to bring in a variety of audience. I'm really interested in what Fall Guys looks like as a sport esport event, as a short, you know, little esport event uh, amongst a number of other events. Uh, Halo's definitely one that we're looking at. You know, despite I would say, despite some of the latency and updates and you know the general uh, deflation in the in the community. Um, on top of that. Uh, we, we've also uh, been looking at uh, potentially. Um, why am I blanking? Oh, sport like like NBA 2K uh, and sports. Yep. But but the the interesting thing is actually part of the appeal of seeing 
these guys play is that they're playing something that is so out of you know their normal element and a lot of a lot of football players don't want to play Madden because yeah. they play the real deal and either it reminds them of work or the experience just doesn't match up um yeah. but but that said we're still looking at a few games i i'm also i'm a i'm a apex fan um and i think there's been a resurgence there there's some great momentum uh, and that's something that that we're we're also interested in um andy such a good answer so very interesting the choices um for our listeners uh we've started doing this segment on every podcast it's called judge jimmy's cross-examination it's everyone's favorite new segment for those of you who don't know how it works uh jimmy's gonna ask andy our guest uh a few rapid fire questions try and get to know andy as a person as a gamer a little bit behind the scenes and uh and and hopefully uh rapid fire here so all right judge jimmy take it away Awesome. You know, I, I want to ride this wave of, of your last series of answers, Andy. And, and as a personal Apex fan, first question, what legend do you play with? Oh, dude. Um, you know, I'm, I'm uh, so I, I started out, dude, it's been, it's actually been a while. It's been like probably three or four months since I played. And my memory sucks. But uh, Speedy McSpeederson. Um, Mr. Octane, Speedy, Octane, 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 Oct I've got the one that's um, crazy. It looks like a, uh, uh, it's definitely like samurai inspired. It's a uh, gold the demon horn. mask with the horns. Yes. Yeah. Um, I cool. love his look. So that's, that's definitely my fave. No doubt one of the best classes for a, for a group so that you can push, I think, uh, other classes. I, Paul, I'm getting so into Apex right now. It's ridiculous. Great answer, Andy. Um, nice. Let's go to the next one. Favorite game of all time. Ah, Man, I mean, darn, darn, man! Um, <laughs> wow, he just okay, said it. Favorite, wow, you know what? Castlevania, <laughs> Castlevania Symphony of the Night. Oh, I, I don't think I we've played it three that. times. Wow, that's, a, that's, a, that's, that's an interesting cool. choice. I've not it, heard that one. It is, yeah. I, I figured so. I, 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 I'll give you some explanation there. You know, a few things. I think, like, I played Castlevania Symphony of the Night in high school. So formative years, right? I had just gotten a PlayStation. I played that in Metal Gear Solid, which Metal Gear Solid also on the top 10 list probably, just, just because it was so impactful, right? It, it was one of those experiences that made me change what I thought games were capable of. Um, yep. and, and, and something that, you know, the depth of, of Castlevania Symphony of the Night was something that got me the art uh, I felt like it was an experience when the castle turns over. I thought this is an experience that like keeps giving and doesn't stop. Um, the music is great, and I love the gameplay. I find Metrovania's extremely addictive as gameplay moves. Um, acquire, explore, open up, level up, keep going. I, I love that experience. So I, that, that's definitely my favorite. Love, love the reasoning here, Andy. Uh, moving along now, this can be your favorite movie or show adapted mm -hmm. from a game or sharing the same IP from a game. So I would love to know your favorite, uh, yeah, movie or TV show that again, either originated from gaming IP or that shares crossover IP. Oh man, that's hard. Oh, that's really hard. Um, give me a sec. <laughs> it's definitely not the Super Mario movie. Uh, Super Mario Brothers. Uh, it's the most. It might be the most entertaining from a purely ironic standpoint. For the wrong, um, yeah, for the wrong reasons. For all the wrong reasons. Oh, you know what? I, I'm going back to. Uh, I'm going back to Castlevania. The Castlevania animated series is awesome. It's great. Is it is on I Netflix? Right. It. Yeah. yeah, it's on Netflix. It's on Check Netflix. it out if you get a chance. Yeah. Uh, highly recommend it. Highly, highly. Um, if I had to pick a second. 
I, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know if there's anything that's made an impact on me like that. And of course, it's my favorite game of all time. So there's certainly, you know, something there, but it's also an incredibly well done series uh, and, and highly entertaining. I, I recommend it. All right. I mean, can't argue with that. Last question for you, Andy. Uh, this could be any game, but the question was inspired by Fortnite because they just do so many collabs. What's your favorite collaboration or activation between a non-endemic brand and a gaming uh, event or video game in general? Yeah, fantastic question. Um, you know, I, I do love, I think, I think it's brilliant the way Fortnite has incorporated, have, that has become a platform for pop culture, a, a, place, a place where different characters can come and hang out together, where Darth Vader can hang out with Captain America. Um, oh, man, that is a really, really good question that I should have a better answer to. Um, you know, I would say anytime Doritos is involved uh, in a brand collaboration, usually pretty awesome. Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer for this one. I can't. I really, I really should. And I can't think of anything at the moment. I mean, I would agree that anything Fortnite touches is honestly doing pretty well. I think they've done a great job at it. But, um, but no, I, I love the answers, Andy. You don't have to defend them. You just got to share them. So I appreciate everything that you did share. And uh, uh, thanks for coming on the show today. I'm giving you back to Paul. The, the prosecution rests. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Andy. Andy, for our listeners who want to find you, who want to follow what you're doing, who want to find out more about Subnation and what, you, what you're doing there, like where can you be followed or found? Yeah, um, Twitter is where I'm most active for sure. Um, obviously LinkedIn, but, uh, but Twitter is probably the best place to follow what I'm doing. I'll tweet out anything that is, that is relevant. Uh, to be fair, I got to get better about that. And this will probably force me to be a little bit better. <laughs> um, Subnation, uh, Subnation has accounts. I will, um, you know, when this goes, I will share out those accounts as well um, to follow what we're up to uh, because there's a lot of stuff coming, um, and I'm excited about it. There's almost too much at the moment, but uh, yeah, it's it's going to be it's going to be a crazy 12 months. I'll say that, and, and keep your eye on uh, keep your eye on my account for lots of cool stuff. Very cool. I, I definitely think our listeners should be uh, staying tuned, keeping up with what you guys are doing. I think that league sounds like a lot of fun. So uh, I'm very anxious to see to see it, uh, you know, go live finally. Um, yeah. For those of you who are, um, uh, you know, uh, regular fans of the podcast, I just want to say a couple of housekeeping things, guys. Uh, Wednesday evening, we do a weekly news show. It's like the podcast. We cover a lot of news and topics of the week, but it's a bigger cast and we do it live with you guys so you can get in our faces, challenge us, ask questions. Uh, it's a lot of fun. I highly recommend it to come to that weekly news show, that live stream Wednesday evenings, 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. Also, make sure to follow Business of Esports everywhere on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on Instagram, on TikTok, on YouTube. Um, you name it. On every single platform, you can find us at Business of Esports or Busy Sports. Uh, Jimmy, thank you as always. Andy, thank you uh, for being on the show. Uh, don't forget, guys, the most important thing, the future is fun. We'll see you guys next week.